Hey there, welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Jeff Sengpil, CTO at Keycode Media. This is the show where we interview leaders and experts in the AV, broadcast, and post-production spaces. We're giving you the inside tips to grow your media workflows and business today. Excellent. All right, let's get into introductions. We'll, we'll start with me. I'm Jeff Sengpil. I'm the CTO at Keycode Media. And John? John you? Rutherford, Senior Solution Architect, Keycode Media here in Detroit. And Kelly? Senior Project Engineer out of Detroit. And Matt? Uh, Matt Hilton, uh, Manager of KFB Studios in Louisville, Kentucky. Awesome. So every superhero needs an origin story, doesn't he? Uh, let's start at the beginning. Matt, can you talk about the early days, those early decisions in terms of KFB's programming, and the gradual investment decisions that needed to be made with equipment? Uh, yeah, uh, Kentucky Farm Bureau is uh, a unique organization. Um, we are an ag organization, a lobbying, essentially a lobbying firm for farmers, and also an insurance company. Those two things don't seem to go together at all, and they kind of don't sometimes, as you see with lots of variety of content. Um, but uh, one thing they've always been is, is a heavy investor in video content. Uh, when I came to the Farm Bureau in 2006, uh, we actually produced a, a statewide TV show. Uh, it was a show about Kentucky called Bluegrass and Backroads. Um, we did stories on most anything uh, going on in Kentucky. And that's really the reason I came to Farm Bureau uh, from the start. We also did a, uh, a video, a piece of video content that was uh, recorded on VHS tapes. Uh, we had one VHS uh, deck going into 20 other ones and send it to all 120 counties in Kentucky uh, called Kentucky Farm Bureau Reports, a uh, thing that we put a lot of effort into uh, that no one watched. So uh, it was just one of those things. I think every, every video producer's had those moments where I'm making, doing a lot of work uh, and, and, and not getting a lot out of it. But, so that's what really when I first got there, uh, what I was impressed with uh, coming from uh, working at a news TV station in Louisville was their investment in video uh, at a company like that. Uh, so farm bureaus are in every state. Uh, there's one here in Michigan. No, I know some of the folks who work at the Michigan Farm Bureau. Uh, some states decided soon after they, they became an organization that they, the farmers of that organization didn't have insurance. So they said, hey, let's put all of our money in a big bucket and we'll start a company for uh, insuring farms and farm equipment and farm crops. So that's what the Kentucky Farm, did, the farm Bureau did, uh, among other states. Some of those insurance companies became so big that they became nationwide insurance, state farm insurance, and farmers out in California. So uh, those different state farm bureaus, I believe Illinois, North Carolina, became so large that they decided to go national and they became huge uh, insurance companies. Ours is just in the state of Kentucky. And through the years, it, it has grown so much that we're the largest insurer in Kentucky. So... When I came to Farm Bureau, I came to do that farm lobbying side. I worked for the Kentucky Farm Bureau Federation. That's the older piece of our Farm Bureau. Uh, so everything we did was mostly agriculture content and then this TV show that really, frankly, was about anything. Uh, but in 2020, I get a phone call. We're on the road. We're finally back shooting uh, stories on the road uh, through COVID, which was such a fun time for everybody. Uh, and I got a call from our president that he was moving our video team of three into our insurance company, uh, mostly to do it a massive investment in, our, in a live studio uh, for, for, for what we do for insurance company and for the Federation. So that's kind of where Key Code came into play. We had already worked with them a little bit uh, in our Federation days to enhance our server. We had a smaller studio space with essentially a a big conference room we painted black and put some lights in the ceiling. Uh, but today we're, we're, we're working with them right now to build a fully functional live production studio. So it's been a pretty exciting couple years um, and they've been a great partner for that. So the, the, the thing is, in all of that, there was a discovery made. Um, you had a discussion about the initial plan everyone was gonna have and you all made the discovery that there was a need for a more permanent studio. Uh, what was the timeline and the decision making that needed to happen at that point? Well, um, COVID changed a lot of things. Uh, we have um, really four audiences that we work towards. Uh, we have 
farm and non-farm members, so regular Joes that just buy insurance and farmers that are buying insurance for their house and car, but also their farm and different equipment. And then we have internal audiences, our employees and our agents and regional staff. So really, we had lots of different reasons uh, to have to, to speak uh, in a live function. So they wanted to enhance virtual meetings, enhance our ability to go live immediately and speak to these people all over the state. Uh, Louisville's a centrally located city in Louisville and in Kentucky. So to be able to speak to all 20 counties, all 120 counties all at once, uh, to speak to members, um, it, that was really the, the genesis of it, beyond just our field production where we run out and shoot stories on farmers and different things. Uh, the ability to go live was really important. Um, so that's where really the, the thinking of the studio uh, came from. Uh, we, had, we did a few uh, audiovisual events where we went live and, and like a lot of folks had to do uh, virtual events instead of in-person events for our farm side. And we, those were successful, but they saw that we had to set it up and tape down cables and put lights in it and do a lot of work every time we did that. So I think that was a little part of it, too, was building a facility that's ready to go live at all times. Ready to go live is it's a huge, huge thing. Um, we're going to get into the equipment in a second. So when did your phone ring from Matt calling you saying, uh, dude, we've got, we've got some work to do here? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, they, to Matt's point, they, once that transition happened of moving from the agricultural side to the insurance side and them being softly greenlit to go forward with the project, um, they brought us in right away to kind of help put some of those pieces and parts together to help design the overall solution. Um, some of the early points of clarity were it's a small production crew, as Matt said, three people. So those of you with production experience know that while there's a drive to have fewer seats, um, it's also a challenge. So we've looked at automation, we've looked at ways to consolidate uh, while still providing the ability to expand out when the time comes without having to do major uh, upgrades or, or equipment replacements. So that, Pretty early in the process, uh, they brought us into the conversation. It, yeah, I'll speak to that. One thing that was interesting is, like, I'm the video guy, so I know how to build a studio. Uh, that's not the case. No, you know, I didn't know how to do this. Uh, so just finding someone that, that had before, and we had worked with them in the past, and so it was an easy easy call to make. So. And, and in honor of this, we've got the soft green light on each side of the video screen today. <laughs> so let's get into the equipment decisions. Uh, at some point, you're going to have to make decisions on the equipment that's going to fit best for your productions. A lot of choices, a lot of vendors. Uh, we know uh, that the, the budget always gets a little interesting as you go forward. Uh, what parts of the budget did you put toward high-end equipment, and where were decisions made to shave the budget or find low-cost alternatives? Let's start first with the, the, the big part, the, the studio overall design and the architecture. Uh what was nice about moving into the insurance company, we went from a nonprofit to a for-profit. So that definitely changes uh, your budget. So that was a nice piece of it. Um, frankly, a lot of the early budget talk, we were under what they were expecting, which was also very helpful. So not to rub it in on anybody that's deal with budgets. We, it's not that we didn't have a budget, but that wasn't a huge concern. Um, what our, our space in the building was actually a, kind of a dead zone. It was... Uh, a former uh, wing of the building that was only our servers for our entire organization. And with that technology improving over 25 years of the building, that got smaller and then it became kind of this, I called it the cubicle uh, cemetery. You know, like those little chunks of cubicles and storage and it was a useless spot and it was on the first floor of the building. So they really wanted to try to enhance a, an area of the building that kind of was a wasted space and it actually fit really perfect with what we needed to do. Uh, I had the server drop floors and uh, plenty of space to go up and down, frankly, to make it as tall as possible. Uh, and then it was a, a, a pretty uh, large space. We were given 50 by 32 space, um, almost the size of this room, it feels like, uh, to, to be able to work in. So uh, that, that was really helpful. Uh, but from a budget standpoint, it was, it was a full reconstruction of the area and then adding the technology. So uh, unlike the other uh, studio we had, 
having Kiko there from the start to see kind of what we were gonna actually build and then frankly wire it while, while it's being built was really helpful and actually probably was a huge uh, budget savings. Um, when we were looking at what are we gonna be, that really evaluating what I was actually getting asked because we didn't get great direction of what the studio was gonna do. It, it kept leaning into being able to speak to those people quickly and live. So we went from having more of a, uh, uh, just a big creative workspace to having truly a live studio with a set, with branding, with functionality, with, uh, with uh, flexibility to be really anything, to be an agriculture set, to be a, an insurance set, depending on what we're producing. Uh, so yeah, when, when you, you have to make those decisions so then you know what you need to make. And then that was the genesis of different types of rooms that do different types of function. Uh, so yeah. And you can tell by the pictures, it looks better than a bunch of old filing cabinets and cubicle parts. Yes, it, um, it's a very improved place. So. Much different look. Um, so speaking of the look, it gets into camera systems. Uh, anyone want to jump in with what the, the choices ended up being there? I'll take that for a second. I'll, I wanted to mention that Creative Dimensions, the partnership that we kind of entered in with, um, was the, the brainchild to the design. Um, in concert with their creative team, um, which really kind of brought everything together when they, they built out that design. So I'm a camera guy too, and I, I go down there and I know they're shoot, shooting on uh, Canon C300s and they had ordered some more Canon uh, 70s, the new, new cameras in the block. And I'm like, okay, you're gonna do broadcast with a cinema camera, right? So here we are building these rigs on uh, Mark Roberts' robotic heads. Um, so it was kind of a Frankenstein kind of build, if you will, each one with a Q script prompter I'm throwing names out there, but, um, you had a lot of weight, you had a lot of weight on here and, and then the automation part of that so that they can actually control these cameras, cinema cameras from their, um, video control rooms. So, um, really it was exciting to see that cinema, you know, shallow depth of field, all the flexibility that you get for, you know, a creative look that you want, um, now you know, on these robotic heads, and uh, I think that really came together. You know, it was, it was definitely a challenge. Yeah, we wanted to be able to, to, you know, a lot of the things we'll do live production-wise uh, could have packages and stuff that we would shoot outside of the building. We wanted all that to look seamless and look the same. So uh, be it finding a, a repurposed need for our, our C300s we had and using those bodies as studio cameras saved a little money. It wasn't necessarily like, we had to do that, but it helped save a little money and then it gave us a reason to, to enhance our field production cameras. So now when we make a video, they all kind of look alike. And that's that was really important to us, was to have that that look that, that runs through every video that we, we do. So. And one other component on those Mark Roberts robotic heads is we included in that design the server that runs the motion tracking software for that particular uh, technology so back to the idea, there's only three people in the room running the production. Um, camera operation, which is a normal position, of course, in production, who's gonna do that? Well, it can be automated, right? I mean, obviously they still have, as Kelly said, the physical controls and a web, a web GUI interface in the control room to go in and make fine tunings for the person who's sitting at that video console, but for the most part, those camera heads will just automatically track someone if they're doing a presentation, for instance, you saw in some of the, the video there. Um, you don't have to have someone standing there just doing that slow pan. The camera does it automatically. It keeps that person centered in the frame. So those kinds of fine tuning elements really are gonna pay off in the long run with regards to enhancing the production because they won't have to spend time and effort doing those simple tasks. Yeah, and managing this team, I, I see no future where we would have enough people to do that ever. <laughs> so it, it was, it we're a team of three today, and we might be a team of five in two years, but we're never going to be a team of ten. So it, there's there's a limitation even in the future of what the video team at Farm Bureau is. So we had to do something um, to, to be able to do this, to pull this off. So automation was a big part of the whole strategy going into it, um, it from just literally everything, how the lighting is is uh, is twerked, uh, twerked, <laughs> is tweaked, 
um, and everything. So everything was, uh, the, the, the idea of automation was definitely a big part of, of that for us. We did also include some Sony uh, PTZ cameras in the mix. At the time, Canon didn't make a PTZ camera. So the idea in the design was to give them those extra angles that they may need, if, even if they're just for cutaways. Um, and those are also tied into the Mark Roberts software. So again, a PTZ is fully controllable and trackable to the individual you point it to. Um, so just again, giving you the extra angles where you need it. And, and speaking of Canon, just uh, we had some technical difficulties this morning. So that Canon head that we're recording this on came off of the show floor and went into service this morning. So uh, props to Canon. Thank you, um, Canon. So the, the other thing about cameras is they don't do much without light. So what were the decisions behind the, the lighting setup y'all went with? Yeah, again, it's that ability to be live fast. Uh, so we bought enough lights to, to have multiple zones throughout our studio. Uh, so where we didn't have to get up into the, into the grid and move it around. Uh, so we have around 60 plus lights in the ceiling and a full uh, light deck. Two separate to universes. Um, Austin can walk around with it, the controller on his iPad, um, makes it really sweet. Actually, there's quite a few different apps that we're finding out with the Yamaha board. So everything, we actually put a private Wi-Fi system in so they can hit all these different appliances that have apps. So it's walking around with a lap or a little tablet, you know, iPad and controlling everything they need to control. Private yeah, again, that, make a note. Yeah, that automation uh, to be able to do work almost everything in our control room in studio if you need to. We'll be able to work our microphones and everything if we have a, a talent or someone in there. Um, there's the opportunity sometimes we're going to have moments where there's only three of us and two of us are going to be gone and that, and Austin, one of my guys, he'll have to do everything. So we had to be really, really automated. It's, it's a, it's a, it's going to be a tough thing once this thing really gets kicking. Hopefully they say, Hey, maybe give another person or so, but, um, there's going to be days we're gone shooting at a farm or doing something outside the building. So we had to be super automated and the iPad and thinking all that, uh, was, was really good to do right from the beat. Awesome. So you're doing a lot of streaming work, and that also gets into the discussion about video switching. Um, you know, what kind of, John, why don't you take this one first? What kind of decisions were there around the, the, the choice of a video switcher and the streaming output? Um, so as Matt mentioned, we had done some work with them back in the um, Farm Bureau Federation side, and at that opportunity, we basically put together a new tech TriCaster road case with uh, PTZ cameras over NDI. Again, focusing the design around the fact that this needed to be something very lightweight, not physically lightweight, but lightweight with regards to setup and teardown. So as few of cables as possible, centralizing the, uh, the uh, control interfaces and so forth. So for that application, that worked really well. When we started looking at a more permanent installation and quite honestly, to, you know, provide a little more functionality and capabilities, uh, we moved over to the Ross side. And so they've got a Ross Carbonite uh, switcher uh, with obviously a panel in the control room, Ultrix router, a 64 by 64 router, uh, and an expression graphic system. Um, we've already started designing some dashboard interfaces. Dashboard is a free software that Ross has for their products that can communicate seamlessly and um, through HTML5 coding can provide touch screen level capabilities across all the different pieces and parts of their ecosystem. So again, back to that idea of one person potentially being able to run the production, uh, but also being able to fan that out if the time's appropriate. Um, we've got touch screens at all the main positions. I'm not sure which pictures are coming up on the behind us here, but in the video control room, we've got the, um, the Carbonite uh, panel with a uh, uh, Ross touchscreen that's interfacing directly into that uh, control panel. We also have a separate uh, touchscreen on that console that can be punched up to anything in the environment over the network. Uh, similar to what Kelly was saying with the, uh, the iPad in the studio, the operator in that 
in, at that console can put up whatever they want on that screen and not have to touch a mouse, right? Because they're already running the control panel for the ROS. So that screen is literally right in front of them. They can change the router feeds, for instance, or whatever they need to do. Um, that console is also dual rolled in the sense that um, there's an editing system set up on that console, an editing position. So the editing computers are all back in the data center and we're doing KVM extension to the endpoints where those need to go. One of those being in the video control room at that console. We have two KVM positions in the audio control room, which I did see a picture of that. There's kind of two big consoles in there. One's for the uh, Pro Tools S4 panel, and the other one is uh, for the Yamaha CL3 for production audio. Then they have a dedicated editing room kind of down the hall. Um, again, all of those, they can punch up any computer from any of those positions and be able to work with them. Um, Altrix was a, a no-brainer because of its density. Uh, and again, the flexibility of, uh, for instance, when we start talking about audio, we're actually gonna be bringing MADI into that router and embed that directly in through the router. Um, it's given us the ability, again, with dashboard to simplify the user experience to be able to control that router without having physical control panels. Um, and expression is expression. I mean, it's just the perfect solution for their graphic needs. And their people have already gotten, I think Michael's already trained on that, right? So, um, so yeah, that's all gonna come together and give them that uh, position. So even if they need to bring someone in on a freelance position, someone's gonna be familiar with that layout. Makes sense. Um, any other thoughts on video switching and the streaming setup? Oh, I didn't cover streaming. <laughs> I forgot about that part. Um, so we've got a four channel AJA Bridge Live uh, built into it. It may be in one of the pictures uh, of the rack. Uh, so that's going to provide them uh, to take whatever feeds they want, send those out to uh, up to four different CDNs, um, which kind of leads into the another conversation with regards to IT. Um, so from our stand, I might be going off script here, so pull me back if I that, get too far fine. down a rabbit hole. Is there anything um, else line item here? Go for it. Okay, great. So, you know, a project like this, um, particularly in the time frame that, that we were working in, um, one of the big issues we, we were running into was supply chain. Uh, that was an industry-wide problem. It was a global problem, and that consequently had a dramatic impact on the overall timing and scheduling of this project. We started physical uh, delivery of equipment and installation in January of 21, wait, 22, <laughs> 22. Um, and we still didn't have everything. Uh, we still had equipment that was up to 12 to 15 months out. So when you're trying to plan an, uh, an expansive install like this and you're missing critical pieces, there's just things you can't do, which leads into the next challenging obstacle we ran to, which was construction, right? Because these, as Matt mentioned, this space was purposed completely different than what it ended up being, um, to the point that rooms didn't even exist that we needed to be able to start working in. Uh, walls weren't up, um, ceilings weren't in place, wiring was not in place, so we really had to schedule our trips down to Kentucky around not only what equipment was available, but what rooms we could actually work in. And then the third kind of leg of the chair was um, working with their IT department. Um, IT departments, by their nature, have to be very protective of their networks. Uh, security is absolutely the most important thing. Um, in the case of the, uh, the Farm Bureau and the insurance company, their data center uh, is co-located with the Indiana Farm Bureau. So their IT department is not just uh, responsible for protecting their own data, but someone else's data. So we started those conversations with their IT department almost from the first week of, of our discussions because we knew that was gonna be an important part of this to make it work. Make another um, note, talk to the IT department early. <laughs> that's right, absolutely. Um, everything hits a network now. So we did build a, a very extensive uh, multi-subnet network within 
our little bubble of what we were doing in the production arena, but we did have to outreach into the house network. And there was many, many, many conversations and meetings and discussions and rediscussions and more meetings. And it was not that their IT department was trying to be difficult. They were all on board. It was finding that happy medium between what we needed a network to do and what they needed to protect. And again, having those conversations um, weeks and months in advance really made things run a lot smoother. Yeah, speaking to that, almost every department in our company, the security makes sense for them. <laughs> We're the weird thing that wants to stream out and send videos over Dropbox and do all just do all this stuff that scares them at every, at every stop. So uh, our, our messaging to them was always, we don't want the three video guys to be the reason that the Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance Company comes, you know, crumbling down. So, um, but yeah, speaking to that, every piece of technology ran into our security every single time. And every piece of software that had to be loaded ran into our security every single time. It all get flagged. So that's been fun. A lot of internal uh, discussions when they're not even in the, in the building uh, with our IT department because their, their number one priority is not making videos. Their priority is to, to protect uh, customer information and the company. So uh, it, it, we, our priority is to make videos. Theirs is not so... It, but they've been very helpful uh, through through all of it. They want to help. They think it's cool. You know, this whole area is really neat. They're techie guys and gals too. So they, they thought it was really neat that we're even doing this. Um, but yeah, that's been a, it's been a hurdle, but it's one we're we're getting past. I'll say one last thing on that. If there's anything that good that came out of COVID, is that IT departments now understand what video is on a network, right? Because everybody was doing Zoom meetings. Everybody was doing video, this and that. And they now like, yeah, we've seen that. We know what you're talking about. We get it. As opposed to, oh, no, we can take care of that. Like, no, you can't. You really can't. We're doing 25 gig to the desktop for their editorial systems. So their department, their IT department was like, we don't even have 25 gig interlinking right now. <laughs> like, and you're doing it to the desktop? Yeah, and we've yeah. been talking about networks and specifically lighting and camera. And their audio is a, a true Dante network everything's done there is some AES in the mix but it's all Dante through so they can route any source to any destination which is really quite amazing within the, the structure of how things came together um, for talkback microphones for pushing audio into any room um, it's a pretty slick interface well I mean speaking of audio <laughs> it's really important isn't it so with, without without audio, video is surveillance. You, you mentioned Dante and a little AES mixed in there. Um, what sort of cool stuff in, in terms of the audio side has is, is, is been brought to bear on this? Well, we have a, a CL3 Yamaha board for the production side of things, and then an Avid S4 for um, you know sweetened audio and mastering. Uh, but they have a media review room uh, where they wanted two positions, a front and rear laptop position, and uh, Dante played a crucial role in directing the audio um, to the endpoints. Um, so those laptops are on. Uh, John mentioned we have, uh, I think we have six different VLANs carved out in the environment so that each one of the, the laptop positions are uh, able to see all those different networks. So it took a little creative engineering um, with some hubs and dongles to have every one of those networks seen by the laptops. So uh, yeah, CAT6 isn't going away or, uh, you know, IP technology is, is here to stay. And it, it actually, there's more wires, but they're smaller, you know, and uh, they can do much more through the, the network. Yeah, and just to add to that, and the slide was just up of the audio control room. So when you see that picture cycle around again, you'll see again, there's two consoles in their production and post-production. Um, on the post-production side with, with Pro Tools and the S4, uh, you'll notice the, in the photo, there's, it's a 5.1 environment. Uh, and as Me Kelly was mentioning, the media review room is also 5.1. So while they currently don't have an audio technician to run that position to the full extent that it can, um, it was the uh, Field of Dreams model, build it and they will find it and come. So when they do find candidates for that, um, that audio technician position, 
the goal is to have that person walk into the room and go, oh, yeah, this is good. We got everything we need. And they can, uh, they can get in and really start producing some amazing content. Yeah, and that room is a good example, too, of something else we, we ran into that Keycode helped us with. Um, our workspace is built in a collaborative workspace and equality workspace type office, meaning only certain roles got offices and everyone else is in cubicles and these open areas for collaborative workspace, right? So when you want to build a four wall studio and a four wall edit suite and a four with, with no windows, with all of these different things, it, it got a little sticky with that. Um, everyone has equal workspace and we don't. We have the best workspace at Kentucky Farm Bureau without a, without a doubt, right? So finding, right, it, it's, but it is what it is. There was literally a discussion. I said, are we doing this or are we not doing it? You know, like we, we got to, there's certain things that come with this, with this uh, project. Um, so our, our video control room and our audio control room had to become multi-purposed. It had to, it had to be, do a lot. And which was probably a, a, in the first drawings or so, we had dedicated rooms to do dedicated things. And then here we are trying to make multi-purposed uh, spaces. So that, that changed a lot of the strategy of how will those rooms work. One day it's an audio sweetening. One day it's uh, recording a podcast. Next day it's live audio. Next day it's an edit suite, just a video edit suite. So that particular room has a lot of different functionality. And it, it, so they had to kind of work with our rules uh, on how we build offices, workspace uh, rules at, at Farm Bureau. And they did a great job of giving those rooms a lot of multi-purpose, which I thought was, it, it turned out great. Um, but that was definitely another curveball from the start that something I didn't even know about and that that was going to be a, a sticking point with, with this whole design. Yeah, and an extension of that is what's not in the photos of the uh, video control room, audio control room, uh, and the media review room is the acoustic panels that will be going in or are hopefully going in right now <laughs> since we're going to be down there next week um, to, again, kind of help control some of the, the sound in there. The rooms were designed uh, with multi-layered drywall with insulation in the wall to make them soundproof both inward and outward facing, um, heavy duty soundproof doors. But to Matt's point, windows were an unmovable requirement for these spaces and um, sound and glass don't necessarily play well together. Um, the idea of putting curtains in front was not an option. So uh, where those windows needed to go, um, the decision was made to go with the angled, angled windows, again, insulated uh, to, to keep sound in and out. Um, but yeah, that was um, a bit of a moving target for a little bit. So one of the interesting things though is with less people in collaborative spaces, your communications really isn't as big an ask as it would be for a separated studio. What, where, what happened with comms in this setup? Uh, you know, intercom, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. We're going to have a, an intercom just in like a, a, a God mic uh, yeah. from the video control room into the room. Yeah, another, it's a Dante appliance, a, a VOG, G, God, or voice of God mic uh, that's in the space. And again, on the Dante network, we have talkback microphones in each of the rooms. So they can, and they have eyes with, through one of the PTZ cameras. So uh, again, uh, we didn't go with like ClearCom or any other, you know, RTS, any kind of uh, hardwired system. So the talkback mic is always live and they can uh, communicate. And no, and no phone based systems either. Um, so the, the, the thing is, we already kind of touched on this. The, the install you went from an awesome design and was on paper, all the buttons and knobs and video outputs, and at the end of it, not everything arrived as advertised or worked exactly as it advertised. We got into those challenges and how uh, morphed the schedule. So what's left is content. Um, now that you got the new studio, what's the plan? How are you going to use the studio for internal stuff? Yeah, so I was in a lot of, the, I would get the quotes and then I'd go back to my team and said, guys, we need to make videos. If we don't make videos, we're in real trouble here. Uh, so we built the studio for a, a um, 
a lot of different options. Again, those, those audience I talked about, we have farm members, we have uh, 70,000 farm, 70, family farms that are part of the Kentucky Farm Bureau that are all over the state. Um, those people, over time, they get elected into positions and they are our board of directors. So the board of directors at the Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance Company are all farmers. It is 30 farmers throughout the state. So that audience is number one, really. <laughs> so we, we, we've got to make farm content. So a lot of that is still field production. We'll be leaving the building and shooting stories at farms and those types of things. Uh, but we want to, we're, we're a, an issue-based organization on that side. So we're going to have issue-based discussions on a discussion set. Multi -per we can put up to six different people and have a, a diverse conversation about ag issues, those types of things. Uh, we're going to host a, a debate forum between our governor and whoever that will know today, whoever is running against him. Uh, that will actually, piece of that will be done in our studio. Uh, so from an agriculture standpoint, we're going to be doing a lot of things where we're talking about issues that farmers face in that studio. Uh, Voices is a feature on a farm member that does something. That's a that's a field production piece that we do. Uh, we do an, uh, a thing called Farm to Frankfurt. Frankfurt, Kentucky is is the capital of Kentucky. Uh, so we have our one of our farm elected leaders will be speaking to our head of public affairs about things that are going on in Frankfurt and how that affects them on the farm. So we're going to have a, a simple discussion. Um, recently, we had our our Secretary of State come in to talk about voting um, and how it's safe and you should do it. Uh, there's been some, some information out there in the last few, couple of years about uh, that voting's not necessarily uh, completely uh, fair. So he's, he came in to speak to that. So it, it's, it's gonna be used to speak to those farm members about issues that are facing on their farm and kind of what Farm Bureau is doing for them. What are they doing? Who are they? Who are they do they have clout? Can they get the governor to come in and, and, and be a part of a, a discussion about ag issues? And, and so the studio should be able to help them lobby, frankly, uh, on farmers' behalf. And that's what we look forward to that. Our other main audience is actually employees. We have around uh, 500 employees in our building. And we even just uh, here recently, we're going to do a, an executive message to, to the employees um, immediately live to to their computers all over all over the the office so uh being able to speak to employees telling them what's going on farm bureau giving them updates on their hr stuff those kind of things we've been talking about a some form of a good morning farm bureau tv show uh like a like a hr show um we've Juj even yeah. jujitsu training yes well, and we'll we'll have like employee engagement where they get to come in and do a little game or and then we'll have some information about an actual something coming up, a blood drive or whatever. We'll do features on things uh, far, uh, some of our employees are doing. We have a feature uh, segment we do called Employee Spotlight. We just call it Spotlight without it airing that. And we would probably do that once a month or maybe even twice a month that would go live from the studio. Uh, so that's another piece. Um, and then our agents, we have over 400 agents in Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance all over the state. And they've had, they have um, in-person district meetings and they would like to do that less, but have more district meetings. So our studio, the live studio, will be a perfect place to do that. So we're gonna have some kind of an agent uh, call in webinar show. And we're gonna make it like a TV show and make it real fun and, and professional, not just you know a fancy Zoom. Uh, in, in there to speak to that audience. Uh, and then we have claims adjusters all over the state. We have uh, hundreds of those all over the place that check your car if you get in a car wreck, you know. So there's a whole department of that that's all over the state too. So we have a, we're, we're a big diverse organization with lots of different unique audiences and everything kept leaning to the idea of trying to be live or live punch a discussion or, or do a live, live stream. Um, and the really one of the last kind of neat things that we want to do is uh, a, make it a pundit location. So um, right now, a lot of our farmers will be asked to be on CNN or Fox News, uh, and we'll be able to actually do that from our studio space, um, which could be interesting to some of those politicians again that we're lobbying. So, uh, so we're just going to be at a really diverse, cool um, studio to make lots of different types of content with it. Awesome. Multiple messages, multiple audiences one video studio hub to make it all happen automated with a smaller crew 
Um, it sounds like it sounds like this has been a win all around. Yeah, this has been. Uh, it's a neat thing for me. Uh, it was somewhat of a legacy thing. It's going to be kind of neat that like at some point I'll leave, and I'd like to think it's still there. Who knows? Um, so that's been kind of neat. Um, I got a couple younger guys, and they they actually had input on building a a giant corporate studio, um, which they probably never would anywhere else. Uh, so those kind of things are really neat. And then I think it's just going to be a great tool uh, to communicate for our organization. Uh, you know, be able to be live and be quick, and it look really good and be branded and ready. Um, is, is, is really been the, the ask, and I think we're going to be able to deliver that. Awesome. Matt, Kelly, John, thanks for joining me today, uh, talking about some technology and how to get the messages out there. Thanks for watching Broadcast to Post. Please make sure to subscribe to the podcast to receive future episodes. Follow Key Code Media on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram to receive news on additional AV, broadcast, and post-production technology content. See you next time, folks.